This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. And with me today, with French flag lighting, we have Hans. Hans, how are you today? Yeah, good. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a little distracted because of the, the discovery that I did a couple of minutes before we started the show. Right. You're talking uh, Senior Citizens <laughs> YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah. we'll, show, we'll show our special yeah. guest tonight these, these videos in just a moment. But hey, you know, it's been about a year since we had Oki on the show. Oki, how are you doing tonight? We're going to unmute you. What's up? What's up? I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I love the show. So, yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad to have you back, and you are uh, on a roll with your YouTube documentaries. You just had a YouTube documentary drop, uh, what, in the past week, right? Yeah, yeah, on my uh, channel. Uh, it is actually, I'm already fucking blanking on the name here. I made the fucking name. The last Deadly minute. Basement of a 4chan Doomer. <laughs> Doomer, yes. There you so, go. So, um, you know, um, I've started calling myself a YouTube documentarian recently because, like, I think that. Most YouTube documentaries, it's just people like they um, they just gather clips online and they just like read articles. And then, you know, it's just like a rundown. But what I've been doing, uh, you know, especially for like my past like five or six videos is like I actually go out, you know, I meet people. I uh, do on camera interviews. I get exclusive footage. And it's much more like a uh, traditional documentary than uh, what people are accustomed to on YouTube. So, yeah, I just put out this one and um yeah, you know, it's got a great response and um yeah, check it out. Yeah, okay. you're you're on your way to a million views at this rate. Um yeah. I, I would just say at this point you're a documentarian. I wouldn't even put YouTuber in front YouTube's just the platform. YouTube yeah. could disappear in a week. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, you're doing real boots on the ground work with these documentaries and it's impressive stuff. Um I, I do that. I do have a question for you tonight. Do you consider documentaries to be a legitimate part of the filmography of somebody who does not primarily work in documentary film. For example, the director we're talking about tonight is William Friedkin. His mm -hmm. last movie was a really <laughs> terrible documentary that I was uh, devastated by because I was like, William Friedkin has finally made a new movie, The yeah. Devil and Father of <laughs> Morth. And it was one of the worst things he could have come up with it, it was horrible it was hardly even a, a feature length i think it was like 68 minutes but it was put out in theaters and uh you know so he's got this little blemish in his filmography but there's plenty of like narrative uh scripted directors who do venture into documentary work uh, I, uh there are tons some of them get their start yeah like Werner herzog is mm -hmm. a great example where you know his documentaries are great. I think that Grizzly Grizzly Man is probably the best thing he's ever done. And also the funniest. Yeah. I don't know, like, <laughs> that movie's fucking hilarious. Um, so your question is, I didn't quite get your question. I don't quite understand what you're. Well, it, all right. Think about it like this. If I'm a fiction writer and then I write a nonfiction book, mm -hmm. is that suddenly given the same weight as all of my fiction novels? If you do a ranking of my work. Are you including the memoir I might have written along with all these fiction novels? Do Ooh. you think it's one and the same? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. You know, if if they're primarily a fictional director, like I don't think that people look at Martin Scorsese and think like about all of his, you know, the concert. Uh, the stuff Rolling that, Thunder Review, yes. Yeah, that, they, they don't really think about like um, that or like that Bob Dylan, like the four hour documentary made about mm. Bob Dylan. They, those feel like side projects for him, but with like, I think Werner Herzog is the best example of this because now he's primarily a documentarian. And I think that's sort of um, for a lot of people, it has usurped like a lot of his earlier fictional work, even though a lot of that stuff is great. And, yeah. You know, I've probably enjoyed uh, his documentaries much more than uh, his traditional scripted features on the whole. I do think his work with Klaus Kinski is uh, terrific. And I actually thought uh, his movie Family Romance LLC, which feels like a documentary and it's shot with like really cheap uh, cameras. He might've shot it on like an iPhone or something. I, it, like it has like virtually no color correction done to it. That's a great movie as well. I thought that was one of the better movies released in that abysmal year for film. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't know. Just curious about that. Hans, what do you think? I don't know. I don't watch documentaries because I'm not smart enough to get them. <laughs> I'm waiting for a narrative and I'm just like, I don't have want to have to think. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like uh, 
I, I it's difficult to say because uh, with those couple of examples that you guys gave, uh, they both they have both good uh, fiction and good documentary. So I think it'll be tough to to uh, dismiss uh, documentaries uh, just because it's not their main, I guess, work. Um, and with that, I'm, I, I just realized that I have said nothing. Uh, <laughs> but, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I, I see them as like the, as equal, I guess, as, as their movies, as long as it's like a full length and not just like a half an hour. Well, it, it's not a matter of one being superior to the other. It's does this count as part of this canon? I think so, yeah. Why not? Why wouldn't they? Because it's you know? not scripted. It's a document. I don't know. I don't know. Just something to ponder, maybe, for the listeners and the viewers of this program. We are talking about a fully scripted feature tonight. We're talking about a feature that I believe was maybe based on a play uh, mm-hmm. or was at least written by a playwright, uh, Tracy Letts, who mm-hmm. also scribed Killer Joe, which is William Friedkin's follow-up to this movie and arguably his last film. If you believe documentaries are part of that canon, then no, it is not his last film. Uh, this is a movie I have not checked out until uh, recently for this program. I like to leave myself, when I really enjoy a director, I like to leave myself one film to watch at a much later point. Right. So with Stanley Kubrick, I've seen all of his films except for Spartacus. I have Spartacus on my shelf over there. Haven't watched it yet. Just holding on to it. Probably not his best one to hold on to either. Um and with William Friedkin, it has been this one. And I also just haven't been that eager to get around to putting it on. Uh, but man, did I enjoy this film when I put it on today. Um, Oki, this was your selection. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, you selected Joe the last time we had you on. That's another great film. Uh, yeah. I, can't even, I can't remember what we started. Oh, Sorcerer. Sorcerer, yeah. We started yeah. with Sorcerer. So yeah. we're back to William Friedkin here. Uh, what made you pick Bug? Dude, I'm not, you know, here's like the thing. You said horror movie and like, I don't know. That was the first thing that came to my mind because I don't, I don't know how much I'm like into horror as a genre, to be completely honest. Like, I really appreciate like the filmmaking aspects of horror. Um, and it's, it's oh, it's like when I see something technically really well done, I, you know, that's something that um, obviously I really enjoy. But there's something like um, a disconnect for me with most horror um, because I just I don't get I don't find it scary, I just yeah. find it impressive. Um, so I kind of I I prefer more so like psychological, over the top kind of like stuff like this or like, you know, a more mainstream example would be like Black Swan. Then I would like you know, a mm. uh, more traditional like you know, like a slasher movie or something. So this was a, I I don't know this was the first thing that came to my mind i was like and i've been meaning to get like at least someone to watch this for the longest time because <laughs> i love i love this movie i love how fucking over the top it gets yeah you know, especially <laughs> near the end um so yeah that's that's kind of it it's just it's just crazy it's a I, fucking intense insane movie i think the, the biggest problem about horror especially with people that have been around the internet for for years is that well, I was watching uh, cartel beheading videos when I was like 14. Yeah. So anything worse than you're not going to find anything worse than that in a horror movie or, or anything that's that realistic that would actually scare you. So, yeah, I, I completely get where you're coming from when it comes to horror. I, I like it more when it's goofy or when it doesn't take itself seriously. And unfortunately, nothing that I've watched recently has been that uh, other than. What is it? Terrifier? Terrorizer? I keep messing up that name. Oh, I got a uh, Terrifier. Yeah, uh, but that's that's one of the issues that I have with modern horror is that uh, A24 kind of ruined that genre a little bit because some people believe that it has to be slow and it has to, you know, no no jump scare or anything anything that might create a reaction from you it's more like well look at how uncomfortable you're gonna feel after we're staring at this wall and this ugly person for three minutes you know i can't wait for uh, them and to that's... do that to that friday the 13th series that yeah. they're doing for peacock yeah that sounds horrible what a prequel right yeah by brian Where fuller I... yeah we're gonna see a mentally handicapped child shot very beautifully <laughs> you're gonna see his his blisters and his gross face in in eight in 4k 
Beautiful. Yeah, that doesn't sound appealing to me at all. Uh, but I agree with you uh, when it comes to horror that it's it's very difficult to connect with the scare factor of it if you've been around the internet for a couple of years. Oh yeah, for sure. And you know, here's the thing with that I um, yeah. So there are so many horror movies that come out these days, especially within the past couple of years, because I think that it's like low investment and then high reward because they you could you could have a theatrical release for horror movies. You know, the t teenagers will go see it mm -hmm. in droves, right? And it could be made for like uh, two million to three million dollars, but then they're they all feel the fucking same. Like mm -hmm. all of them feel the same, dude. and they all have the same pattern and the same. Um, like, I don't know. It feels like it's written by the same person every single time. I think the only one recently was that, like, Barbarian felt a little like it felt a lot different than what I usually see uh, coming out. Um, and then there was something else that I forget about. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it just it just feels like the same movie over and over. Barbarian has been the I guess shining example for for horror so far this year. That one has gotten uh, tons of good reviews. Everybody seems to love that movie except for Hans. Yeah, um, <laughs> oh, really? yeah. Wait, we're covering it. it. Yeah. We're, well, we're covering it next week, so we shouldn't delve okay. too deep into All that. Right. But go, yeah, go ahead anyway, Hans. Rant. It's just I I hate when a movie. It's going somewhere and then it just turns dumb so that the story can happen. Uh -huh. uh, well, this movie shouldn't have happened. Within the first two minutes, you're just like, bitch, just go. And then yeah. she stays and you're just like, all right, so she's dumb. We're setting that up that she's dumb, but she's not. And then she is. And then the, I feel like it just flip flops whenever the movie needs it to. And I hate that. I hate when when everything that happens needs the main character or the other characters to do something really stupid or to have a, a decision or make a decision that no one with a thinking brain would do, and that's what puts them in peril or in you know in danger. And I just also I, I didn't like the design of the of the monster. It was very hills have eyes -y, but not as creepy. And that mm -hmm. came out what twenty years ago. The reason, yeah, I mean, my my, my only problem with Barbarian, um, aside from it kind of becoming more of like a generic horror film toward the third act, yeah. was that monster feeling more like uh, like something you'd find on Mad TV. You know, <laughs> I, I, that's, that that was my perception of it. I was kind of like, hmm, okay, but like I didn't really have any real qualms about that movie. I, I thought it was probably one of the for a year where all of the horror movies are getting. 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. People are really gassing up these films that are mediocre. Yeah. Like it, it seems like if it just gets dropped on Hulu, you're going to get great critical reception just because. Um, yeah. I thought that was one of the less offensive examples of that where, you know, I can understand where people are coming from, where they think it's a great movie or a fun movie or a good movie. I didn't have a bad time with Barbarian. But again, we'll get into that next week. With, yeah. with Frank Austin coming back. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what have you seen this year? And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about William Friedkin's uh, body of work. Who, me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, dude, I have been mostly just watching older movies recently. I just, um, mm. god damn, I had a fucking long list of them, but... Um, you gotta get on Letterboxd. I started one. I started one recently. Let me try and find that shit, because I, I did start one. That's what I do every time. Yeah, always I ask me, I'm like, oh, let me. If I don't remember what I just watched. Let me go back. I use that more as just like a cataloging <laughs> website for yeah. this show more than anything else. Just so I, I, I know what we've already talked about. I know what I've watched this year. Um, it's been a pretty decent year on the whole, though. I think for movies, uh, but yeah, for the most part, I have done a deep dive into uh, tons of horror movies just the past month, just this past week. I was watching Toby Hooper's The Fun House recently. That's quite enjoyable. Um, do you have any thoughts on Toby Hooper, Hans? That's not somebody we've really talked about at length before on the show, but we've gone to Romero and everybody else. Yeah, that's one of those old, what is it, uh, um, Masters of Horror that I don't think we've spoken much about, and I'm not very familiar with what he's done, so let me pull that up. Yeah. Uh, he did Texas, Texas Chainsaw. Chainsaw one and two, right. uh, Salem's oh, okay. Lot, Poltergeist, I just Tarantino. I've actually seen Funhouse. I did. I wasn't crazy about it. That's the thing. But it was. Uh, 
This is, you know, it's all right. It's a, it's a standard eighties film. I think yeah. it has like a kind of cool idea for a monster, I guess, which is just, it's a birth defect. Yeah. That's all it is. Keep it simple. <laughs> it's a birth defect. Uh, Tarantino did it, his final chapter in his book on the fun house, uh, that just came out yesterday. I think it was I, cinema I heard, speculation. I heard some stuff about that book. Like it's like really mediocre. Did you enjoy it or? It's, uh, I mean, if, I listened to the audio book of it. So um, he only narrates the first and the last chap, like the prologue and the epilogue. And uh, it's really just a kind of fractured thoughts of different movies. Like he could have done this as a podcast or something. It, it, it felt like he got a two book deal with Harper Collins or whoever put out Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the, the novel. And uh, he was just like, all right, well, let me just write my thoughts out on 12 different movies. I feel so, like, yeah, oh, it's sorry. whatever. I feel like every any time I listen to Tarantino talk about movies, it's literally him just being like, "And this guy who was in this movie, in this obscure movie, was in this <laughs> thing." And then, like, it's literally just connections. It's like, like very autistic, very like, you know, cataloging. Like he's got like like uh, a cataloger's mind more so than you know, like, and like I I, I can't h hate on him for that because like personally, I'm not really that great at like doing like in-depth film criticism or whatever but uh he just seems like a like a fanboy more so than, like than like a deep intellectual type yeah you know? and it, that definitely comes across in the writing i i don't think you know he's got some very questionable opinions on movies in general where you know everybody loves to point at him saying the lone ranger the army hammer lone ranger uh, was one of the better films of 2014 or 2013 whatever it dropped uh, but, you know, as far as his taste goes, when it comes to like movies from the 70s or 80s uh, and what films he chooses to criticize, uh, he, you know, he, he never really has like a universally sound point. He's very distinct in his opinions that are tailored to him and not really, um, you know, you, you can't treat it like the Bible. Like he was very he wrote a chapter on Paul Schrader's hardcore in that book, and it's just completely negative. And it's about like how snuff films are just a boogeyman and Paul Schrader was was putting that. It felt like very weirdly activisty for for sex work or something. Um, I don't know. It, and it, it just seemed like you're missing. the. Who was he dating at the time? I think that's what we need to look up. <laughs> right. um, and it, it kind of just felt like he missed the point of, I don't know, what the movie was or was supposed to be. So. I don't know. I, I enjoy Tarantino's opinions for what they are, but I don't treat them as um, sound necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, much like um, much like somebody like a Nicholas Winding Refn, who uh, infamously did verbal battle with the director of the film we're talking about tonight, <laughs> Bug. Um, I think I, I, I think I've said this before on the show. I it is my opinion that William Friedkin is the best living director. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's anybody better than this guy. And that's not to say he has like the most consistent filmography because there is certainly a lull period in his career where you get to probably the mid eighties up until maybe this movie. Yeah. And there's not a whole lot that is worthwhile or worth looking at in there. Um, I think a lot of his best films came uh, in the seventies and then you have cruising in 1980 and then it's it's pretty hard to spot what is good up until he teams up with Tracy Letts. Yeah, Blue Chips is pretty good. <laughs> I actually hear that one is good. I haven't. I yeah, haven't, yeah. I I haven't not watched it though. He made like is, is Blue Chips the football movie or no basketball? Oh, it's that's a basketball with Nick movie. Nolte, right? Oh yeah, okay. Nick Nolte playing the coach. Yeah, breaking the rules so that <laughs> you know so that his players get. He's like, um, motivated by the screaming white guy. Yeah. It's, it's got some, shock in it. Like YouTube video or something talking about it. Like talking about, they were talking about like college sports and like, oh yeah, Nick Nolte's character in that movie. Like he decides to like start paying the, the players under the table or something. That's like, I think it was, it was Shaq's first movie, if I'm not mistaken. He was oh, very really? young and, and lean. You wow. know that that uh, famous acting career, Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I was a big fan of Steel when I was a kid. The the Superman spinoff movie. So uh, he had a very illustrious '90s film career between that and what was it, Kazam? Kazam, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I haven't seen Blue Chips. That's one I'm getting around to at some point. Uh, but I did watch The Hunted from, I think it was like 2002 with Benicio Del Toro and Tommy Lee Jones. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that was real painful to sit through. That was <laughs> pretty rough. I Honestly, I, I if it's not for, I, I, maybe Tracy Liz did 75% of the heavy lifting with these later Friedkin films. Because if you just ignore this one and then Killer Joe, yeah. And you just take a look at his 90s work and then leading into the devil and father of Morth, it's like, that's more mm -hmm. consistent. And it's not good consistent. Is that like that, the... it's, it's, oh, wait, no, sorry. Go no, go, go. Is, so is that the... <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you can go. You can go. I just, I, I don't know if you're going to move on from this haunted movie because I don't know if I've seen it, but is that the one with Tommy Lee Jones uh, running as a very old man where he just runs chasing after someone he's just very sad as a very old man 25 years ago that's right yes yeah okay that's all to, that's all i wanted to i say. used to have that on vhs that's one of like uh, the movies were when i was growing up but uh i was gonna say like uh when it comes to like the heavy lifting it also helps that like a lot of the actors that were on doing those tracy Lutz stage plays like uh michael shannon are also in these movies you know, oh, I didn't know he did the play as well. See, I don't know yeah. anything about um, the the actual plays of this and of Killer Joe. What are your thoughts on Killer Joe, by the way? Oh, I love it. I love it. I love how fucking dirty both of these those movies are. Yeah, it's yeah. just like dirty, grimy, like fucked up movies. Like uh, in this one, they're like doing meth, like in, right in the beginning while they're partying. <laughs> you know, you got like domestic abuse. Like in fucking Killer Joe. Uh, what's that? lady's name from that movie bound who's also in this uh um, fuck and she's also i think she's also juno temple no not juno temple but juno temple gets naked a bunch of times <laughs> Kill her yeah mm -hmm. uh, that's no. that's what she was hired for i think and around that time it was just like oh that blonde girl who shows gets her boots. naked yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah that's, that was her whole thing no anyway so there's like in killer joe like one of the first scenes like um it's just like this the the actress the one who with the KFC at the end, like the first scene, it's just her. Oh, with Gina Gershon, right? Yeah. She's got a Merkin on and she's like fucking all like, like nude from bottom, like from her bottom, you know, up. Like she's just wearing like a shirt and just like her vagina is just like out. That's one of the first scenes <laughs> in Killer Joe. You know, it's just a dirty, scuzzy, fucked up. Like both of them are just, yeah, just in the gutter. And, you know, I really like that about them. You know, yeah, uh, you Killer Joe. Them. Killer Joe really creatively invigorated me when I watched that back in like 2011 or so. And I've gone back to it and I still enjoy it. I think it's a very good film, but it doesn't have like the same uh, energy to it that it had when I f first watched it. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that Matthew McConaughey wasn't like current day Matthew McConaughey. So it was kind of a very interesting, different off type role for him before he uh, became known for True Detective and Dallas Buyers Club. I think this movie bug might be better than that. Um, oh yeah, I agree. Yeah. It is wow. much more stripped down and they do something with this film in that, you know, much like a stage play, it, it's set in one location, but they make that location interesting uh, period mm -hmm. more and more periodically throughout the film as Michael Shannon's character gets more comfortable there and, or rather less comfortable there and starts <laughs> losing his mind yeah. uh, more and more in like the tinfoil, it just all the tinfoil everywhere. It was it was uh, very visually interestingly done or a way to handle a single location film. Did you notice from the beginning of the movie, like uh, I think it's the first scene, you hear the black helicopter like mm -hmm. going around mm -hmm. like it's like it's a constant thing throughout the whole movie that there's like, you know, the conspiracy of like the black helicopters following people. You could just hear like the. Um, with the engine of the of the helicopter and it starts right from the beginning it's um it's good like the energy of that movie it's just it's incredible yeah yeah michael shan is definitely pulling some uh, off the bat uh some very ted kaczynski vibes with his character where he's talking about uh hearing the machines at night and, and all that um <laughs> ashley judd is also very good in this movie for oh, some reason so good I, you know i i didn't have a particularly high opinion of her acting career and i'm not yeah. even really sure why that is because i don't think she's done anything that's been you know I, it, she, during this time downright terrible she used to be uh the one like the girl in the 90s who did all of the um, like like the thriller movies like with like morgan freeman yeah double jeopardy 
And like oh, that no, no. Would like... Uh, that was Tommy Lee Jones. She did, uh, yeah. what was it, A Long Came a Spider or something? Kiss the yeah. Girls. Yeah, yeah. But then she did like like a string of them. Like that was mm -hmm. what she was known for. She was like, she played the cop or the lawyer that, you know, I don't take shit. Yeah, you better get out of my way. I don't take shit. Mm -hmm. Like that was her <laughs> whole fucking characteristic in like the 90s, you know. Um, and then, but she's so fucking phenomenal. I was so surprised, like, the first time I watched this, how fucking good she is. Like, she, I don't know how even someone taps into that. Like, it felt so fucking real. The, like, you know, that kind of, what is that, uh, term uh, again, where it's like two people who are in a relationship and code, codependent kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Where she's like screaming at the friend when she's trying, like the friend's trying to help her. It's like this is the only good thing in my life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't. Fuck she got it that. Up. She got that autistic penis once and drove her crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What did he say? He says, uh, "I pick up, I pick up on things, and he makes people uncomfortable." Yeah. And then he says, "I haven't been to bed with a woman for a long time, but I think I could go to bed with you." And she's like, "Okay." And from then on, you know, they become this uh, inseparable couple of very unstable <laughs> people. Yeah. They, I, you know, he's got a great line uh, as well that I think I posted to the Facebook group. Uh, where she's like, uh, so are you into oh, yeah. women? Are you, you know, she's she's trying to question him about his history. Uh, the line is, are you a homo? I'm not anything really. I'm done with that. That was Michael <laughs> Shannon's uh, response to that. His character is so, feels so authentically mentally ill. Like yeah. the way that their relationship unfolds and how there's this shared delusion between them and, and it absorbs her essentially feels so realistic to me in that you know you kind of at first play along if you've ever like been around a mentally ill person for like a significant amount of time you almost have to yeah i'm referring to you hans that's <laughs> um you know you almost have to find yourself at points where you're playing along with it but then you can yeah. get sucked up into that if you're around that person for too long and it can just become this very unwinding terrible thing and it does in this film it gets very uh grotesque and I think part of the um, part of the genius of the writing and also the direction is not making it immediately obvious that it's a delusion. So there are parts that kind of go along with what Michael Shannon is saying, like the helicopters being outside and all, all of that. You know, you're not immediately in on it, but anyone with common sense by the very end of that is going to realize with this man torn up trying to pull egg sacs that aren't there out of his body. <laughs> um, you know, it's all just in his head. He's created this situation for himself. It is so fucking terrifying when that's what kind of why, like when he said, hey, do you know any horror movies that you want to talk about? And I, I when I think about that, I think about him pulling up his shirt and showing all of those fucking scars and scabs and fucking open wounds. And just like the first time I saw that and actually even when I rewatched it, it was just so fucking unsettling saying that. You know, like, hmm. well, when he starts taking his tooth out, or well, he did that multiple times, but the first time he just goes, uh, and it's like, yeah. like dealing with a, yeah, like dealing with a child that doesn't want to let go of something. So you're just trying to get to him, but the kid is still doing it. <laughs> I, it felt like that, where she's like, no, don't do that. And he's like tr pushing her off him uh, with his elbows as he's pulling his teeth out because they have bugs in them. Or no, eggs, was it? Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was eggs. I yeah. think it was eggs, yeah. Yeah, he uh, believes that there was an egg sac plant planted in his tooth and that they're somehow trying to find them through the bugs or something. They're, they're right. government and bugs. He, remo he removed multiple teeth because I guess he couldn't find the right one. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, he's, he's a great character. Harry Connick Jr. also gives a uh, surprisingly good performance. Not that I've seen him be like terrible or anything, but... <laughs> Uh, he's primarily known as a singer, right? So I, I don't know. I only know of him from like guest appearances on Friends and shows like that, shows I don't watch. So I, I don't know. Uh, that was another reason probably why I was holding off on watching this uh, is because of Harry Connick Jr. <laughs> Honestly, We're being I, I, third I don't even bill. know who that is. Uh, he's the uh, like the deadbeat just out of prison. Uh, oh, no, I know. 
like I kind of guessed who that was in like the movie, but I don't know what he is otherwise. Like he's a country singer, I guess he said. Uh, yeah, I don't know I what don't he sings. I thought he did like um like like jazz or something. Like a crooner? Yeah, yeah. I think he might be a crooner. <laughs> huh. I would pull it off, but we'll get flagged immediately. Yeah, we don't need to listen to the, the hits of Harry Connick Jr. Um yeah, no, he, his, his filmography is primarily like Law and Order and just procedural appearances. So uh oh when Harry no, that's discography. Never mind. So, uh, yeah, uh, this movie is really something interesting. And it's kind of, up until, I guess, recently, because they did add it to HBO Max and, and Hulu, it's kind of hard to track down a decent copy. It's on DVD, um, but it hasn't been pressed for Blu-ray or any other format since. And I'm not even sure if it was on streaming for a period of time. Uh, Hans, how did you ultimately wind up watching this movie? The reliable one, two, three movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I had I had like five torrents going. They didn't move at all. I couldn't find a streaming service because Hulu is not. I can't use Hulu here even with a VPN. And HBO Max uh, didn't have it for Latin America, so I couldn't watch it there either. So I ended up, yeah, uh, one, two, three movies. In... I never used that site actually. And I torrent like a, like a fuck ton. So yeah. I'm gonna add that to the list of movie of sites to use. It's um, not bad as a last resort. Um, it's yeah. kind of on par with what you linked me with, uh, Oki, in terms of uh, just trying to find something. Uh, because I primarily use, well, I'm, you know, YTS.MX is like the yeah, best. I that, yeah. that, I don't Hell know yeah. how they haven't been shut down yet. <laughs> um, that's always quality. That's the best streaming service as far as I'm concerned. You know what annoys me about that site is like when I, when I a torrent a foreign movie and they don't have the subtitles with yeah. the with the movie so then you have to go yeah. and you have to try and find the subtitles but yeah it's you gotta go to annoying. yts subtitles .com or yeah, something like yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> uh, i tried to get peter von kant from that site that is a uh, a remake of the fassbinder film the bitter tears of petra von kant and it said it had it and i downloaded it i was so excited and then i i turned it on and uh, it was just like twinks dancing in their underwear for seven minutes. And I, I started to go, wait a minute, this seems <laughs> older than 2022. What is this? What, what is this, uh, LimeWire? <laughs> yeah, yeah that's what it, I got LimeWire there. It was not the movie. It was just some other movie. I have no idea what that was even. Uh, and they, whoever did it cut out the title from the movie so no one would question it. So uh, I got learned some that. gay porn. Yeah, I basically <laughs> got gay porn. Uh, so that that was not great. They, they failed. The that you, you got the tender moments of a gay porn <laughs> pornography. <movie. laughs> I, I I gotta say something real quick about Bug. It's yeah. in the trilogy of Michael Shannon uh, being crazy movies that I fucking really love. It's a it's the it's an un um like it's not a, an actual trilogy, but in my mind it's a trilogy. So it goes from this Bug to Take Shelter, where he's like he he just feels like the need to create like a fallout shelter mm -hmm. right and he goes crazy and like everybody around him is like what the fuck are you spending all your money on this fucking fallout shelter for you know and then uh at the end of that it's the herzog movie my my son my son what have ye done so that's that's the thing that ends his trilogy so if you want to watch like three michael shannon movies that where he just goes crazy th those are the three movies to watch and he's really good at being crazy He's the best. Uh, I did watch My Son, My Son, What Have You Done earlier this year, uh, and I quite enjoyed that. I don't know if I've seen uh, Take Shelter. Oh, I feel like I might have caught pieces of it on cable. No, it's a great, yeah, no, that's a great movie. That's like uh, before Jeff Nichols fucking went out and made shit like mud. You know, like he was actually like pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> he fucking made a shitty movie mud. You know? uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Herzog is somebody, you know, he, he's, I've done kind of a, a dive into his earlier work uh, this year, and he has been rising the charts for me as one of my uh, favorite directors that I've just recently gotten into. Um, have you checked out much of his work with Klaus Kinski from the 70s? I've been, I was also looking yeah. into Klaus Kinski a fuck ton, and that is just like a weird, bad dude. Uh, class yeah. can see. There was like there's stories from the set where it's like you know oh I have to pull a gun on uh, Klinsky so he doesn't leave and like mm. oh he's like being really abusive and stuff. 
But at the same time, I feel like a lot of it is, uh, I don't know how much I can trust it. It's probably just like lore, mythomaniac kind of like lore making kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, no, I've, I've watched like uh, Agria. I don't, I always forget how to pronounce it. Agria, Wrath of God and like, um, yeah, a bunch of those movies. So those like really early on to when I started getting to into films. That's like, that was, um, I watched a lot of early Herzog movies. But my favorite early Herzog movie is Trozek, which is fucking depressing as hell. It's about this mentally handicapped guy who like goes to America and then he he gets he like he hooks up with a whore. And then like she ends up I think she ends up like fucking him over or like stealing from him or something. Um, And I don't want to say how it ends, but it's it is honestly the most like depressing. But at the same time, I'll say of- how he kills her. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I watched this recently. It was on Tubi or Pluto or one of those free uh, uh, sites, one of those free, free apps. Yeah, I enjoyed that. That's that's actually probably my favorite of his early work as well. Yeah. Uh, Kinski's terrific in that. Uh, you know, I was trying to get a copy of his autobiography for a period of time, which had to be pulled from publication until he removed some very spicy, very illegal details from his autobiography. Oh uh, no! Yeah, what he did he like, do? He was yeah. <laughs> bragging about his incest. Oh, <laughs> yes. So holy shit! That he's he's not a good guy, or he wasn't a good guy. He died in like ninety two or ninety three. I'm not breaking any news here, uh, but if you are to believe any of that, and according to Werner Herzog, he thought half the autobiography was lies. This guy was pure theater. Loved to uh, paint a picture of himself that was not true, but. Um, some family members have since come out and said, yep, I had sex with my dad. Oh, so, Jesus. <laughs> so that like good. that kind of incest too. Holy well, shit, I was, like yeah, I mean, he's, he's talking about fucking his mom, his, oh. his every female family oh, wow. member you can imagine. Oh, no. Family affair. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, just terrible. But uh, great Nosferatu that Klaus can see. <laughs> I've never, see, I've never yeah. seen... The Werner Herzog notes Nosferatu, but I tried to watch like the first Nosferatu, and I'm like, "All right, cool." I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like I, I think I spent like 20 minutes watching it. I'm like, "Yeah, all right, whatever. That's enough." You that, can that, you can just look at stills from that movie, and you'll get the idea. Yeah, yeah. That is my own cultured opinion, and all of those 1920s movies were just like, "Oh, I see what they're doing here." That's cool i'm not gonna sit here for two hours while an orchestra plays in the background and people move very quickly like i i don't the care only, <laughs> I don't the know. only one that like i could say is like like there's two of them like that um the most obvious ones too battleship potemkin and sunrise are like actually good but then the rest of them i feel like fuck i don't really care it's very it's- difficult it's very difficult to care uh there's a there's some pretty good alfred hitchcock uh silent films one is called oh, the yeah. lodger um and I thought, but it, you know, see, here's the thing too. You can't even really recommend a silent film because the music is so much part of it, right? And if you get with the silent films, you can download five different versions to get five different versions yeah. of the score on that film. And it might change the experience entirely because I've experienced that where I turned the lodger on on YouTube or something and it was fucking horrible. And then I watched it on some app and it was great. And I thought, all right, I can actually go along with this. The music plays such a significant part in being able to hold one's attention. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but aside from that, I mean, it is really few and far between as far as like what is is watchable if you've grown up uh, with just the way the movies are today. Man with a movie camera is another one that's kind of, you know, I like that one. But then, yeah, but the, like most of them, I am not like going to fucking recommend anybody see it. Like, mm. you know, other than like just for sheer film appreciation, like historical context, like what the fuck's the point of seeing them where I feel like. um, Like, it's not really the same for like movies that came out in the mid 30s to the 40s, mm-hmm. you know, 50s movies, even like, you know, after that point, I think after like 1935. You got a lot of more stuff that you can actually probably recommend to like the right type of person mm-hmm. that isn't like, you know, 
a chore to watch. Are there any decades of film for you where it's just like almost an absolute no go? Uh, yeah, now. Well, 2020s, <laughs> right yeah. Now. yeah. <laughs> the, the 2010s on. Yeah, yeah. We're the 2010s is pretty period. pretty rough going too. I I would say like the 1960s is almost irredeemable until you get to 1969. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um. On the subject, though, of, of Nosferatu, are either of you guys interested in seeing, I guess that Robert Eggers remake is going to be happening after all. Um, right. It was previously announced that it was supposed to be pulled from production due to some reason. I guess he couldn't get Willem Dafoe for it, which is crazy because Willem Dafoe does everything. He will yeah. do everything <laughs> if you pay him like $20,000. Um, <laughs> but they're going to do, uh, on the topic of Barbarian, they're going to do that... Uh, Skarsgård kid who played Pennywise, who's in that uh, movie, yeah, uh, as Nosferatu. Yes, Bill Skarsgård. Uh, I would. I'm gonna. I, yeah, I'd be interested in watching anything that Robert Eggers does right now. He's one of the. You know, he's a very interesting filmmaker, and you know, I like The Northman a lot. Um, even though, like at times, it kind of felt like a video game, like fucking Metal yeah. Gear Solid. <laughs> you know, like, but uh, I liked it. I really, I dug it, and you know, I like. I like what he does, so I'm I was anticipating what he does next. I, I I'm intrigued. I'm cautiously optimistic about that Nosferatu film. Uh, I'll say because I really enjoyed The Northman. I didn't think I was going to enjoy The Northman at all. It's not my type of movie. I'm very dismissive of anything that's like Middle Ages and earlier. Yeah, you know, I just yeah. I can't vibe with that. I can't watch like Game of Thrones or Lord of the any of that. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, it, it's just not my cup of tea. You don't like like fantasy stuff. Well, I mean, it, it depends. Uh, I'll tell you what. I recently rewatched the Never Ending Story on HBO Max, and I was like, "Oh, this is fun," yeah. you know. But it's a kids' film, you know. It's oh, ninety minutes, so. Yeah, but on the whole, low. yeah, uh, no, that's too far. <laughs> um, for the most part, I would say that fantasy is pretty inaccessible of a genre for me. What about sci-fi? No, I like sci-fi, but it also depends on what kind of sci-fi. I can't get into like Star Trek and shit like that. Anything that has like a significant lore to it, right. yeah. uh, that's an uphill battle. But if you want to do like a one-off, then I'm I'm in on that. Yeah, no, I get that. My brother's the same way. He doesn't really, you know, yeah, he doesn't really get into like the fantasy or yeah, Star Trek shit like that. I like Star Trek personally, actually. I I dig yeah. it. The only Star Trek anything that I enjoy was actually the, and this is probably blasphemy, the J.J. Abrams films. Oh, yeah, so, there you go. Yeah. Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still watch the classic one on, on Netflix sometimes. Oh, it's I like it. Yeah, I love that shit. From the theme how... song on, the sets, everything is just, it's great. I love how love campy it. that shit is. That shit is, like, yeah. really fun. Yeah, I like the original series a lot. Um, I got to say, like, Deep Space Nine, D Space Dot is probably the best one. Uh, but the original series, like, yeah, I fucking I can just rewatch that shit and like I don't really But do they ever play Beastie Boys on the soundtrack? Like the AJ <laughs> That's a good probably question. Not. Uh, God. A really no. good question. <laughs> Hans, did you check out that what was it, the cartoon or something? Weren't you ranting about one of these new Star Trek uh incarnations that went to Paramount No, well Plus? I I started watching uh discovery when that came out and i yeah, it just doesn't it just it. feels like star wars like it's, it's not the star trek that we learn to like as children i guess uh and then i watched maybe one episode of that um uh what's his name uh I'm so scott bacula no 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 the bald bald captain i just didn't see a new picard. generation oh, so right. i don't know picard picard yeah yeah that was another it's just it's like they don't get you know what the series is supposed to be so i i just didn't like you say i didn't buy i i, I don't say that but was that <laughs> i like didn't buy with any of those two shows was it disney or netflix or what was it like where did picard like where where did that drop was it behind was that? It hbo no it was, it was paramount HBO. paramount paramount okay hmm. Interesting. Yeah. What do you What do you guys think is the best Paramount Plus <laughs> original? <laughs> I don't fucking know, dude. I just want everything. <laughs> well, what did Paramount Plus have? They had. What, remember when we were filming? There were like those ads for Spencer Confidential everywhere in the Seaport District. Uh, yeah. For the Mark Wahlberg, Mark Marin team up, everybody was waiting for. 
You got the Paranormal Activity next of kin. That's an original. That has no ghosts in it. It's just it's, Amish people. It's just they did Amish the people are Evil scary. Four thing. <laughs> yeah, Amish people are scary because they don't shower every day. Ooh, that's the that's the whole thing. But it's at night, so it's creepy. Uh, yeah, there's not really much there. I I don't even know why people get this this service. Watch South Park, Big Brother, Survivor, all right, reality right. shows. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's nothing on there that's really worthwhile. I you know I I tried to check out the offer uh, that I think was a Paramount Plus exclusive that detailed the making of The Godfather, and even that was just oh, like CBS yeah. procedural level writing. Oh, uh, that already came out, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh man, God that, damn that dropped yeah, in was, the summertime. I saw that. I was like, what the fuck. Well, the guy that they got to play Co Coppola, like, actually kind of looks like him, which I was, like, really surprised about. So Dan uh, Fogler. Oh, Dan Fogler. Yeah, Dan. What is his name? Dan Fogler or Dan Fogler? Fogel? Yeah. He was in uh, that ping pong movie, Balls of Fury, Balls from of, yeah. 15 years ago. <laughs> Good for him for being well, able to get he, out of the gutter. Miles he played. Oh, no, God. Yeah. He, yeah, he plays the Jack Black when they can't afford Jack Black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Dude, Miles Teller just like has like fucking bomb after bomb. Like I don't understand. Like I guess he's just like bad at picking projects or something. Yeah, his career I think would be over if it wasn't for that Top Gun movie being like the yeah. biggest thing of the year. Yeah, that's true. And if they didn't hold it, you know, if that had come out back in, I think it was originally slated for 2020. If it just dropped in 2020. Miles Teller would be washed up right now. Like Too Old to Die Young, I think was the first misstep even though uh that creative pairing should have been awesome um did not perform well wasn't even my cup of tea and i love reffin yeah and then just everything that has happened since it's like very poor decision making uh as far as these acting roles go but it's like uh, whiplash was so fucking amazing when like when i saw that i saw that in theaters like three times mm -hmm. i was so yeah. like entranced by that movie like it's so fucking good and then I don't know, Damien Chazelle, like he he did La La Land. I don't even know what he's doing now. He did that like astronaut. Babylon. Movie. Uh Babylon comes out at the end of this year and it's gonna be probably Eric Roberts' first theatrical film in six years <laughs> oh, really? or seven years. Yeah. Uh well, it's got a pretty stacked cast. Holy shit, okay. I, I think Toby Maguire's that. in it. Toby Maguire, holy shit, okay. Is that be his first theatrical release since Christopher Nolan forgot about him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh <laughs> So I, I'm kind of also cautiously optimistic about this movie, although I have uh, like a 4K copy of First Man. I thought, all right, I'm going to love this movie. He's back with Ryan Gosling. It's about you know, Space Jam in the 60s. Fuck. Yeah, it was, it was really like, not good. You know what it reminded me? It reminded me of that Brad Pitt movie, Ad Astra. <laughs> oh, I didn't even see that. I skipped uh, that movie. Just really fucking boring and slow. It's just like, you know, like, I don't know. I just couldn't get into either of those. I kept confusing that movie you just referenced with the uh, Claire Denis, Robert Pattinson space movie, which I don't know. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I haven't even seen that movie. That's by so, that uh, that director, the woman who uh, made... Fuck, what did he make? What did she make? God damn it. I think she did a movie called Trouble Every Day. That's not what she's most well known for. Claire Denis. I, I'm not a fan of Claire Denis personally. Um, High Life is movie. Yeah, that's of. the movie. That's the name of the movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Boy Tra oh. Travel was pretty good. Uh, or Boo. I don't even know how to fucking say that. That's that movie that's actually shot in Somalia. Mm -hmm. You know where like you know my family's from, right? So like, um, well, it's it's Djibouti, which isn't actually Somalia, right? Mm -hmm. This is where like the French people, like the France colonized that part of Somalia and made it its own territory. That's a that's like a pretty decent movie. And then you know you get at the end of that movie that fucking scene where the main character randomly just starts dancing to in the to the rhythm of the night, and it's like a fucking <laughs> four hour shot of him just like dancing at a nightclub. <laughs> it's just like yeah. a great decision in my opinion. Uh, that's a very like David Lynch, Twin Peaks, The Return kind of move to just like linger on somebody who's sweeping the floor for six minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gosh, Italian realism. 
when you're just sitting there as a boy eats his breakfast for 15 minutes and nothing happens it's like cool I'm, I'm learning i guess i remember that that happened to me in college when we were studying that movement that i remember nothing about other than how bored i was with this whole realism thing it's like i don't want to see real time going on the screen that's why i'm watching a movie you know and it's yeah someone sitting in a poor house and a poor table just eating a loaf of bread what's that what's that movie about the like the french movie where it's it's like the, the name of the movie is an address and it's just about this like hooker who's like like making fucking breakfast like oh, the whole fucking uh, movie no that's too that might be too deep of a cut for, for even me <laughs> okay. um i don't know i have no idea I've never heard of this movie. Hans, you want to do a quick search on that real quick? He's breakfast just YouTube, Tiffany's. Hooker, breakfast. <laughs> I did. Oh. <laughs> Hooker, make breakfast <laughs> movie. And I got breakfast at Tiffany's. I don't think that's the right one. Uh, no, that's the right one. That's a, that's a class. That's, that's the movie, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah no i haven't i haven't actually seen i don't think i've seen anything of uh claire denise except for trouble every day which was like a vampire film with vincent gallo and it was like so stripped down can i ask you guys what's your fascination with vincent gallo what's uh going? he's he's just a fun asshole and he, yeah. i think i think he's a great director <laughs> um his q a was also very inspirational learning about his creative process yeah, you went to that, huh? Yes, like I recently. did. I met I met our mutual pal Kino of the Kino Corner, which Hell is yeah. how he introduces himself. Hi, I'm Kino of the Kino Corner. Not I'm Peter. I'm yeah. Isaac, or whatever whatever his real name he goes by is. He's got multiple names. Um, yeah, that was a fun time. That was interesting. I saw quite a few familiar faces in that crowd, and yeah, just learning about how he views art and also like New York in the 1980s and his relationship with Andy Warhol and uh, Basquiat and all these like classic figures of, of late 20th century New York was extremely interesting, but I can't get into detail because there were NDAs signed. So, mm, um, yeah. yeah, but as a filmmaker, as a director with his two um, public stabs at it, uh, I just, I think they're both masterpieces. Okay, did yeah, you did you put his pants on to go to his party? Dude, I, oh man, <laughs> you know, as during the Q and A, I was thinking, <laughs> I should have worn those pants and stood up and said, I'm wearing your pants, Vincent Gallo. <laughs> Do you own Vincent Gallo's pants? I found, so uh, back when he was still being more elusive and he was in hiding, right? Yeah. Uh, he has multiple sock accounts online that he peruses the internet under, like YouTube accounts. There's one, uh, I suspect this is him, called like Juan de Jose or Juan de Carlos or something. And mm -hmm. I remember he posted on YouTube one time, uh, negative comment about some dude who uploaded a video that said, I sold Vincent Gallo my stereo and I bought my son a car with this. And it was a very long negative. It was like a wholesome video. And it was a very long negative comment from Juan de Carlos. It sounded remarkably similar to like any page on Vincent Gallo's website. Um, so through one of these videos, I found a link to his eBay page, which uh, I think it was called like Family Friend Records. Uh -huh. And um, there was wardrobe for sale. There was stereo equipment for sale. And I was like, wouldn't it be cool to own one of Win Vincent Gallo's wardrobe? And there were a bunch of cool, neat jackets from like Vogue shoots and stuff out of my price range. Uh, but what was not out of my price range, and which looked pretty good, was a pair of pants. So I bought these. I can't remember what the pants look like anymore. Anyway, they yellow or something like that? Uh, I have no, no, they were not yellow pants. I would not wear yellow <laughs> pants, Hans. Um, they were just a normal pair of pants. Don't remember what they look like. He shipped them to Paris. And so uh, I found this out later on. I said, hey, listen, I didn't get these pants. I paid X amount of money for them. And he sent me like an essay long apology saying, I will refund your money. Please forgive me. Uh, and also have your selection of anything in my eBay store. I will send you free of charge. That's and so really I picked nice, it. Actually, that was great customer service, right? Yeah. So I went with a different pair of pants. They were blue corduroy bell bottoms from 2003. And wow. I got those. Yeah. And it turns out Vincent Gallo and I are the same size of pants. So, oh, here you go. Yes. Oh man, I would love to see a picture of you on the streets of New York wearing corduroy bell bottoms. There, there's probably a picture on my Instagram. I've worn them out before. So, but no, I did not wear those to the Q and A. That was a real big missed opportunity. Yeah, 
Do you, you remember you these? Have, <laughs> you, you saw them around or? Oh yeah. I, I only bought these like a year and a half ago. These are brand okay, spanking yeah. new pants. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's a story. Hans, I'm going to you... be honest. I'm not, I'm not that crazy about Vincent Gallo's movies. I, I know you're saying they're masterpieces. I just don't, I guess I don't just don't see it. I, mm -hmm. it yeah. There's like kind of I a feel... disconnect for me. Like when I watch his movies, especially like the Brown Bunny is the one with uh, what's her name? Big tits. What's her name? Again. <laughs> Chloe. <laughs> Chloe Savigny. No, uh, Christina Ricci no. is the one. Christina with Ricci. Yeah. Some, yeah. Some Which one naturals. was, um, no, no. So the Brown Bunnies were with the blowjob scene mm -hmm. with, yep. uh, and then the other one is with uh, Christina Ricci. Where yes. he like kind of like kidnaps her and stuff. To me, it's like, I yep. don't know. I just couldn't really get into it, but I should probably try again because it's been, it's been a few years since I watched uh, both of those movies. So I think Buffalo 66 is um, a superior film. I mean, they're very different, but Buffalo 66, I think, is just kind of extremely rewatchable. And I love Ben Gazzara's performance in that movie. Um, that guy's so, great. Uh, yeah, he's excellent in everything. I will say that Gallo shared that that was like the best actor he ever worked with uh, during the Q&A. Um, and Gazzara is which is awesome in anything 1970s. Um, well, he was in all of those. Um, wow, what's that guy's name again? Cassavetti's film. Cass Cassavetti, yeah, Cassavetti's films. Which I, again, I'm not crazy about Cassavetti's films except for um, Love uh, Love Streams. That's like what, really, favorite. yeah. And then other than what's uh, Mickey and Nikki or whatever it's called. What is it called? Uh, Mikey and Nikki is uh, an Elaine May, Elaine May film that oh, he and Peter not... Fox starred in. So like yeah, every other Cassavetti's film, like even like Women Under the Influence, I feel like the performance just doesn't feel like a and like an actual legit mentally ill person. It just feels like someone who's like, oh, this is probably how a mentally ill person acts. So yeah. she just just starts doing like she starts bashing her head and like acting like a fucking retard, but it doesn't really actually work. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's like it feels the same way. Like we're like Nicolas Cage like playing a drunk. Where it doesn't actually work, like when he, um, you know, fuck, you I play always... Vampire's Kiss. No, not not in Vampire's Kiss, but in uh, Leaving Las Vegas, where he's playing a drunk. Where oh. it doesn't actually feel like a drunk. So, like in in Woman Under the Influence, it just it just feels like false. But you know, I've seen that movie, and I think the soundtrack for that movie is great. Actually, I've I've um, I have that in one of my videos. Actually, the soundtrack I paid money to get that soundtrack from the composers Bo Harwood. yeah he just died recently he died a couple of days ago really yeah oh, i was okay. trying to um acquire a song from love streams actually and i never got an email back and it's probably because he was in a coffin mm. God damn, no so, no i internet. hate when that happens um <laughs> but yeah no uh, no 5g in the casket <laughs> no um <laughs> love streams is a weird one to to actually be a fan of that's not one that's frequently mentioned what is it you like about love that's my second favorite after husbands i think it's just um compared to most of his films it's just the most um i guess the most competent one mm -hmm. if that's the right way to describe it it's um i feel like he matured at that point where he made like because love streams i think came out in the 80s so it was after he made it like a, a boatload of movies and like he i think he it's been a while since i've seen love streams as well too so i don't really remember too much about it it's mm -hmm. i think i saw in like maybe 2015 something like that but um i remember that being my favorite out of everything that I saw that he he's made. Um, the, the history of that film, I think is really interesting in that he had directed it as a stage play in the late seventies with John Voight in the role that he played in that film, oh. um, along with Jenna Rollins. And then, uh, he had planned to adapt it with the playwright, and uh, John Voight had to drop out at the last minute for some reason. And he was like, well, I guess I'll just star in it. This is convenient. Um, and then he finds out, I think, like a week or two after they begin principal photography that he has um, cirrhosis of the liver and he's going to die in a couple of months. Yeah. And so he throws out the script to the movie, rewrites it without telling the playwright and turns it into this completely different thing from what the play was. 
And then uh, it was all intended to be like a swan song to his career, which you get the vibe of in those like final 20 minutes or so, kind of like it's supposed to be a goodbye. But the doctor was wrong. He lived until 1989. So he had <laughs> six more years, tarnished his career and did this movie called Big Trouble with Peter Falk and uh, Alan Arkin, which is like a follow up to the in-laws, just a wacky screwball comedy that the original director got fired from. And Peter Falk was like, oh, no, oh, no, my career is over. Can you please just direct this movie? There's no director on this movie I'm working on. Can you do it? And Jan John Cassavetes was like, yeah, I guess so. So that's his final movie, is this movie Big Trouble. I've never I, even heard of that movie. It's um, been buried. I don't even know if it got released on DVD. I haven't watched it before. I don't know if it's any good or not. You know, here's the thing. Like, I've always appreciated Cassavetes, like, but, but then I watched, like, I've watched both cuts of Killing of a Ch Chinese Bookie. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't really like either of them. But I really fucking appreciate, uh. like, what he does. Um Cassavetes yeah. took me a long time to be able to like break through because I had a lot of attempts, especially through Chinese Bookie, because I think I just maybe watched the, so the longer slow. one that the, the the original released version of that film is so grueling to get through because yeah. they just show you like stage numbers that go on for four minutes, five minutes at a time. And it kills the pacing of the movie. Yeah. Um, I, I did think that the re-release moved at a much faster pace. And it was easier to get through. And uh, on on watching that, I was able to like tune into some of the uh, like subtle aspects of Ben Gazzara's performance and like the comedy in that and just was able to really enjoy it in that way. But yeah, for the longest time, I just I couldn't wrap my head around or have the patience for even uh, Cassavetes films and even Woman Under the Influence, which you referenced, like that's a lot of people's like entryway into his filmography. And uh, that's not my favorite. I actually think that's, and I love Peter Falk. Peter Falk's one of my favorite actors, but that one I still think is just not really for me. Yeah. You know what's also not really for me? It's like Nick Nick Cassavetes movies. No, Nick Cassavetes <laughs> is on tour. How dare you? He, he, <laughs> yeah. shot, he shot that, uh, what was it, My Sister's Keeper in my hometown. I remember it was like a local story. Mm. And Cameron Diaz was uh, faking being bald in the city or something that I was living in. Um, and they took over like a storefront and did this whole thing. Yeah. He's, uh, it's kind of funny how you have like the independent auteur of, of the 20th century, the guy. And what does he do? What does his son do? The notebook. Yeah. He does yeah, alpha dog. <laughs> yes. Just, he does the most commercial it shit. It doesn't make sense. And then also, I think, I'm pretty sure he's like a, like a, like a Bible freak kind of dude or something. Oh, I don't know. His Instagram. I mean, it could be. Look, people's personalities and their beliefs are often. But his his Instagram account is literally just like naked pictures of his 25 year old girlfriend and him really like sucking on her neck. <laughs> and putting her, yeah, <laughs> his oh, Instagram handle is like small penis or something. Yeah, is, really? Yes. Oh, so he's edgy. Yeah, he's an edgy boy. He's got tattoos and he's, he's just so I strange. Didn't, I really didn't expect that because I think I saw something about him being like really Christian or something. I mean, he could be. He could be like a born again guy, but he has like washed up alcoholic vibes to him. Oh, yeah. It would probably run to the family, too, though. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah. certainly. Um, there are stories about like how John Cassavetes would like wake him up in the middle of the night when he's like a child and said, hey. I need you to go watch my movie and tell me what you think of it so I, so I can do this new edit. Maybe like a wasted, just hammered in their New York apartment. There you go. Paul Sminas. There you oh, go. Oh, that's that's his Instagram? This is yeah. his Instagram, yes. Oh, man. So this oh, he's is, just fucking. He's, yeah. <laughs> he's a strong man. <laughs> oh, man. He's got the kettlebells. He's got the Joe Rogan kettlebells uh, up there. I started looking into him when he appeared on... Um, What's his name's podcast? A really fat guy who got ripped. Who was in oh, Kevin I Smith know. movies, Boy Meets World. James. Who was any of the the guy Corden. from uh, My My Name Is Earl? Yes. Yeah, uh, I know. I know who Ethan Supley. Ethan Supley. Yeah. That's actually a cool shot with the kid in the fucking in the basketball net up there. But some of these shots are feeling really Pizzagate. What the fuck is going on with the naked? <laughs> <laughs> He was in some really bad Nicolas Cage movie we watched during our last round of film. Hans, what was that movie called? What, what, I've, I've been tr trying to think about it since you, uh, since Ovi mentioned his name, and I, I can't. It just came know. out last year too. It was 
fresh off the press and we put it on and oh prisoners of the ghost land right there was some famous japanese director who did that right see on sono yeah. yeah oh i that guy got me too all right did he? He's seen it. yeah yeah he's oh. great he he's made he made one of my favorite movies of all time love exposure which is like this four hour movie it's four, four hours long but it's fucking incredible it's got incredible pacing it feels like actually like an hour and a half um but yeah he got he got me too so what do you do he, hans let's look this up real quick i, I think had no he idea. like he like he he obviously he uses his um thing to like do like the power dynamic thing what's up is like you gotta fuck me to like be in the thing and he blocked the door while a woman like an actress was like trying to get like away from it he blocked the door or something which is god damn dude i don't know why these guys keep doing this shit but i fucking love his movies it's uh it's it's just unfortunate is this stopping his career i mean this must be like a pretty recent thing i'm guessing oh, it's like it's like the last year or something but he made literally one of the greatest movies of all time in my opinion love exposure uh just this epic movie like it's an epic of a movie not epic like in the reddit sense but mm -hmm. like fuck it an epic of a movie uh four hours long and um I think I saw that advertised on Amazon Prime or some subsidiary is like a TV show, not even a movie. They might have broken it up or something. Or is oh, that? That's horrible. Why would they do that? I don't know. They're doing oh, it. God. That, that all these out. streaming platforms seem to be in the business of taking longer movies and wanting to like, which did not work for Quentin Tarantino's Hateful Eight because I watched no. the miniseries they version did that of that. Too. Yeah. They did? Oh man, that's so horrible. He had an extra half hour or 40 minutes of, of that movie that he cut from the theatrical version. And uh, I remember we did a show on the hateful eight and that's the version I watched. I think that was the same case with you Hans. Yeah. And we were like, this movie fucking sucks. I mean, damn <laughs> Tarantino missed the mark on this. And then we watched the theatrical again and uh, did a second show on it. We're like, how could we have gotten that so wrong? This movie's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. This movie rules. Um, I saw that yeah. in theaters. I saw that um, the 70, 70 millimeter like oh, fucking, traveling road, road show thing. Nice. Yeah, um, yeah no, they were, they're doing it with Baz Luhrmann's Australia as well, which is another long. It's not even oh, like shit. three hours long. They're chopping it up for Hulu and turning it into a TV show. It just seems. You know what I fucking uh, loved? Redundant. I loved Elvis, dude. That oh, Elvis great. is great. I oh, love that movie. Yeah, that was awesome. I think that was the best movie to come out this year. Um, I think that, so too. Yeah. That was a blast. I saw that in theaters twice and um, I got to get around to watching it a third time. That, that did not get old for me. And uh, Austin Butler is just, I'm excited to see him in anything. The fact he's playing like the sting role in, in the new Dune that's going to be coming out. I was very like, whatever about Denny Villeneuve's Dune. Uh, but now I'm much more interested knowing that he's going to be the antagonist of that. I'm not crazy about Denny Villeneuve movies. Yeah, I think he's somebody who's way more hit and miss than people like to give him credit yeah. for. Well, yeah, people like, well, I fucking watch Incendies, and I thought it was fucking terrible. You know, I, I don't even think I've seen that one. Is that one of his earlier no. films? That's one of his earlier movies. It's um, Lady Goes to Iran, and she's like trying to figure out what happened like with her mother, and it's really fucking slow. Like, super slow, where it's like, all right, just like get along with it. You know, like it's like one of those movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to really state a controversial opinion here. I think his best movie is probably Blade Runner 2049. That's the oh, one I. Prisoners, dude. You think yeah, Prisoners, Prisoners is better? Yeah. Prisoners, I enjoyed, but I, I don't know. I think Blade Runner 2049 is even better than original Blade Runner. I so. didn't like Blade Runner 2049 at first, but I rewatched it like uh, a couple weeks ago, and then I really liked it. So I don't know. I guess I was like in a wrong headspace the first time I watched it, but uh, you yeah, know it's it's good. And then um, I think it's like Prisoners, Arrival, and Enemy. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. like more than Blade Runner twenty four and nine. I think Arrival is pretty up there as well. I mean, Sicario is good, but again, I have another. Uh, this is an opinion people people don't really go along with, which is that Sicario two is better than Sicario one. David Soldado. I've never even seen Sicario two. Never seen either. It, it kind of, I don't know. It does like a very old school thing of like taking the principal characters from that first movie and kind of just ignoring a lot of like their traits and even the linear nature. It takes place before the first Sicario movie. And there are 
major character inconsistencies, at least with Benicio del Toro's character. And uh, it's much more of like a, just like a very hardcore action film by comparison. And I like that more than this. Oh, can you believe this is happening? Wow. Uh, Amelia Clark whining. Or was it Amelia Clark or was it some other woman? I think it was John Krasinski's no, wife. You know, it's Emily Blunt. Am- El- yeah. yeah well. no. Amelia Clark is from Game of Thrones. That's right. Yeah. She played so, so Sicario 2 is to Sicario 1 what uh, the Sam of Fall Axe is to Burn Notice. Yes, and it has the Burn Notice guy in it, and he's great. So Nice. That might be something to cover for this show. Uh, okay, what do you think is William Friedkin's best movie? Since oh, this is French a show on Bug. Yeah, The French Connection by far. By far, I don't. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. Uh, I would you put really? that maybe. Come on. I think Seriously? that's like fourth in line for me. Oh man, really? Yeah, I think. Look, I'm gonna be uh, again. Uh, I'm gonna be boring with this opinion. I think The Exorcist is by far his best. Okay. Um, I think that's just classic film of all time. Uh, and then probably it might be just Sorcerer. Sorcerer is great. Yeah, I, Sorcerer would be my second one. Yeah. French Connection is uh, definitely top four or five. I mean, if I'm thinking about it logically, I think French Connection is much better made film than Cruising, but I enjoy Cruising more than the French Connection. Really? It's funnier. Yeah. It's funnier. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't really think, like, I think, like, it's almost like with Cruising, it's almost like um, like a curiosity thing. Like, you kind of check it out. It's like, okay, I watch Cruising. Where, like, French Connection's like, fucking just super solid. Yeah, then, I, I, I agree that it is like uh, French Connections, just American classic, like universally adored. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I think Cruising's just got more character to it. I like, I don't know. I like how seedy Cruising is. By you comparison. like Gay Pacino. I or love fake. Gay Pacino. <laughs> Pacino, <laughs> fake Pacino. Who, Pacino. I don't think he's fake gay. I think he's gay, gay, and he just doesn't yeah. realize it until the end of the movie. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's that, one of his best a... performances, too, very early, but. He yeah goes all in, and it was before he became you know what we know him as now, which is very sad. That's a good double bill to watch uh, with. Um, what's that Sidney Lumet movie where like Pacino robs a bank? Uh, Dog Day Afternoon. Mm. Like hey, he robs a bank to get his um his his girlfriend or boyfriend's like transition. Like that's the whole reason he gets the, he wants to get the funds for his transition, his like sex operation. Yeah. Uh, did you ever see the dog, the documentary on the on the real guy who did that? No, I haven't. That's a that's a pretty worthwhile documentary from about ten years ago, and that guy is just so peculiar. And it was interesting to see him after he was released and old and talking about all these things. Um, yeah, I mean, I I also uh, this wouldn't really be your cup of tea. I watched another Chris Sarandon film. Chris Sarandon plays Al Pacino's trans girlfriend who's going to get the sex change in that movie fright night hans maybe that might be more up your alley fright night what do you what do you think about fright night i've never seen it you've never Wait, seen fright, fright night which fright night no uh there's a movie called fright night from the 19 because I, I was looking into a roddy mcdowell's home movies because he's got his home movies uploaded to youtube from like all these big celebrity parties from the 19 like, there's no sound at all but Roddy McDowell was this uh, classic, classic British actor. For those who don't know, or maybe he was Welsh. Well, this and... is the. We know Hans is showing the Fright Night that yes. I'm thinking of. I don't yeah. think this is what you're talking about. No, this is this is the movie. It is. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about this movie, the vampire that we yeah. see here with the the very Italian looking man. There is, was a uh... guy, that guy right there with the X on his. He did gay porn. Oh yeah, Evil Ed did gay porn. That's right. Yeah, that's what he went on to do after he did after he. Uh... Also, a good double feature with cruising. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was his career afterwards. He just did he did gay porn during the nineties. Uh, what were yes. you gonna say? Sorry. I uh, know Chris Sarandon, the vampire of this movie, plays Al Pacino's uh, love interest in Dog Day Afternoon. So, just a little fun trivia fact. I forget what I, I was talking about. I did not know that. Right I didn't even that. realize that. There you go. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Holy shit. Well, that's the girl. I've never seen Dog Day After. <laughs> that's the one that's supposed to become a girl. Yeah. Yep. No, dude, that's a great movie, too. Like, it's Sydney, Sydney Lumet is probably one of my favorite directors of all time, I think. Yeah, he's, he's just, terrific. He's just so fucking good. 
him, Brian De Palma, William Friedkin, Martin Scorsese. Um, God damn it, there's a few others. Oh, um, Sion Sono now. Yeah. <laughs> After yeah. he got canceled. Yeah. Once he got canceled, he became my favorite. <laughs> you know, I was just I I just picked up from Tarantino's book that De Palma was supposed to helm Taxi Driver originally. Really? It was gonna be Jeff Bridges as Travis Bickle. That would oh. be God, I, I want to see that too mm. though. Yeah. I think that would have been seventies Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges would have been a very boring Travis Bickle by comparison, I think. I, I mean, you know, he's good in um Ah, what was that Michael Cimino film? Michael Cimino's first movie. Damn, I think it was Thunderbolt and Lightfoot with Clint Eastwood. He's very good in that. That's all I've seen him in in the 1970s, Jeff Bridges. Do you like um, Michael Cimino after, um, fuck, what was that movie? What was the one that was Deer like Hunter? the most? Uh, Heaven's Gate? Like, yeah, that's the, the notorious bomb, right? Heaven's Gate? Heaven's Gate is blamed with like killing new 70s. hollywood yeah, yeah yeah uh i would have to go back to that i did not uh i couldn't get on board with heaven's gate it was a little too arduous in watching that it seemed very long too but then he made like a kung fu movie afterwards right no he made year yeah, of the your Dragon. favorite <laughs> that's, that's a, a cop movie about how chinatown was taking over parts of little italy uh, oh okay. in the 1980s so it's not, i thought it was a kung fu movie i've never seen it no, that would make, probably make it even more interesting. Um, no, it's it's a terrific film, but uh, Hans was not a fan. Uh, no. Then people still vent to this day. I just got an Instagram comment saying, the only time Hans was ever wrong on this show, which is already a crazy <laughs> sentence to start writing. Accurate. Uh, yeah. uh, is on <laughs> You're the Dragon. Uh, but Michael Cimino's work after that movie, I wouldn't say that it's bad, but it's definitely not what uh he was doing in the 1970s i think year of the dragon is like his last hurrah it's like a good epilogue to his actual career and he does a movie called desperate hours with mickey rourke in 1990 i want to say it was and anthony hopkins is also in that and that's kind of just like a generic thriller for the time and then he did one with woody harrelson which is like a native american crime drama where he's trying to escort this native american teen killer to the sun uh, chaser yeah sun chaser to a sun reservation has a horrendous poster let me show it, it. does it's a very 90s poster <laughs> oh my go. god <laughs> yeah holy shit oh this one's not better wow nope that's even worse um not great <laughs> yep that first one's probably the best and i watched this for the first time only recently so i i believe i've now seen all of michael chimino's films and uh, this is maybe not a good movie, but it's better than I thought it would be. It's very 90s. They love Native Americans in the 90s. You couldn't go a yeah. single this year without movie, Native American Thunder... blockbuster. Okay. What was that? Thunder... Th God. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Yeah, that's his no. first one. Fuck. The, like, there was like a mystery... like Tropic th Thunder. No, mystery thriller, thriller movie in the 90s. Uh, God damn it. I'll, I'll look it up. Yeah, just... Yeah, just keep talking. Uh, jungle to Jungle. Thunderheart, dude. Thunderheart. With Val Kilmer. I've You've never, never seen, seen I'm not. I go out of my way to avoid Val Kilmer usually. No, I, <laughs> I haven't seen Thunderheart. It's a good movie. Look. It's actually a, it's it's actually a really like solid fucking like mystery thriller thriller uh, is, Western movie. Thunderheart. It's another. It's does he? Does he play a native? No, he plays a he plays like an FBI agent. And oh. like there's some some dispute over water or some shit. I forget. Because he but, plays a native now. <laughs> After he scans her, he looks like an old oh, Native American lady. <laughs> See, I thought oh, yeah. he died in, in, in Top Gun. In the <laughs> Top Gun movie. So I thought he was dead. They you, Did you notice that they did not use his real voice in that Top Gun movie? They, they, didn't, they didn't, huh? No, they oh, gave him a bummer. Gun. I don't even know that. It's just a bummer. It just, would have been. Yeah. It would have ruined it for people. Sure, maybe. I'll be your wing, or what? What is it, line? <laughs> I'll be your tail. That's horrible. <laughs> That's mm. very depressing. Yeah, I noticed that in the theater because I saw the Val documentary that went to Amazon Prime that I think Jack Kilmer uh, shot or directed or something. His son, and uh, yeah, you get plenty of his actual voice now in that movie. 
And then in Top Gun, it's not that. It, Sanitized, it feels, huh? Yeah, it feels like that one uh, Harvey Keitel film from the 80s where they dubbed him because he sounded too New York or something. It was like a space movie. Oh, really? That's fucking right. I saw him playing. I forget what movie it was, but it was. Oh, it was. Um, Selma and Luis. And he has a Texas accent throughout the whole movie. Harvey Keitel. Oh, I, ha- I haven't Selma. seen that in a second. Uh, and Dude. I was looking into Ridley Scott, too. Oh, yeah. Ridley Scott was, was like reluctant to actually direct that movie. Uh, he, 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 he like picked up the script for his production company. And then he was like, uh, you know, I want someone else to direct it. And then eventually he directed it. But I think I think Thelma Luis is actually a really good movie. It's like literally GTA. It's like Grand Theft Auto, the movie where like they're just trying to get five stars the whole time. And it's just like these two women, though. One of them almost gets raped. Then um, I forget if it was Thelma or Luis who shoots the rapist. And then after that, they just progressively do more crimes until they do that famous shot of them jumping off the cliff with the fucking car. But it's, it's a, it's a great movie actually. I'll have to revisit that. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking into some of his earlier works and then also Tony Scott as well, because of Top Gun, I watched the original Top Gun for the first time. I was like, Tony Scott's great. I I didn't think the original Top Gun was anything special. I was like, this is a very pretty movie, but you got to watch uh, Days of Heaven. Days of uh, Heaven, the, the, the racing movie. with. Tom oh, Cruise. yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was a better version of Top Gun. I thought yeah. he did the same exact thing as Top Gun here, but it's actually like it works this time. It's good yeah, this it's, time. It's much better. That that whole kind of Jerry Bruckheimer, like um, big, like fucking glossy, almost music video-esque like movie thing mm-hmm. during the mid to late 1980s. That's Jerry Bruckheimer and like Tony Scott and... Um, I think that like that's like an important piece of film history that actually should be preserved, like should be looked at. But uh, I guess the gloss kind of like turns a lot of people off of it. But yeah. Well, is there anyone doing that besides Bass Lerman? The keeping that gloss, keeping that, I guess, extra, God, I whatever no you want to call it. Is Joel Schumacher still around? <laughs> no, no. He, he, <laughs> no. I think he died like 10 years ago. Did he, did yeah. he die? I didn't yeah. even know he died. His final words were, uh, I slept with 150 men. I'm, I'm I fairly certain. It. That was... That was it. So, uh, no, it's just, it's <laughs> surrounded by his loving family <laughs> on his deathbed. And he's like, yep. I think he was surrounded by all 150 <laughs> men as he passed away. Um... No, it's just it's Baz Luhrmann, it's Zack Snyder, it's Michael. Wait, Bay. he died yeah, in Jack twenty. Jack he died in twenty twenty. You said he died like ten years it ago. Feels he like just died. Ago. That has been ten years ago because of COVID, dude. That's like mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like ten years ago. What was his last movie? I the last thing I actually remember from Joel Schumacher was his Phantom of the Opera, which I think had Gerard Butler as the Phantom of the Opera in it. Uh, he did a movie called Trespass with Nicolas Cage and Nicole Kidman. Oh, yeah, that's horrible. Ben Mendelsohn was in that, too. I think that was a direct-to-DVD ben film. Ben Mendelsohn is, like, fucking great. Have you seen him in Animal Kingdom? Yes. Animal Kingdom is maybe his best performance, Yeah, uh, I think. His whole history is very interesting, too, because he was a teen actor who was yeah. addicted to heroin, and he completely oh, fell he off. Fu- yeah, he played, dude. He, him, and fucking, and also that other movie, the guy, the Jesse James movie, uh, the guy who made that also made another movie with Brad Pitt, uh, where it's like a bunch of criminals or whatever, and like ben killing Mel- them softly, killing them softly. Yeah. Ben Mendelsohn's great as like a fucking like dirty, like he would have like worked perfectly in like Killer Joe or or Bug, like he's just like he got this like dirty kind of like feel to him, but um. Dude, I gotta piss real quick. Can I just say, you know? Sure. I mean, we're gonna wrap up in a second anyway. But if you want to take a take I a just piss, take a leak real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go, yeah. Ahead, go ahead. Kill your cam though, so you disappear from the recording for a few. He didn't. Hear he you. did not. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> can you do that? You can't. I am pretty sure I can do no. that. Let me see. Oh, you can. Yeah. There we go. All right. Okay. So, uh, let's let, we'll we'll get into uh, Ben Mendelsohn a little bit more when he gets back um yeah I, I didn't really have that much to say about bug i enjoyed it i remember when i first saw it uh, when it first came out i rented it you saw this movie uh, before yeah i rented it and i i was gonna see it with my dad i think i was still in canada and uh we thought cool we're gonna watch a, a horror movie with a lot of jump scares and it's gonna be really dumb and then 
you just got this movie where this couple just go progressively crazy. We were both kind of like, this is not scary. <laughs> like, this is not like the the fun, dumb horror movie we were expecting at all. So I I remember not enjoying it as much as I did this time uh, where I was in, you know, clearer mind and, and not expecting what this movie isn't. Because it's, it's a horror movie, but on the, I guess, in the non-horror way where it's more realistic than than what you expect i guess now you were expecting what evil dead 2 in a motel yeah something like that i don't know something about a bug and 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 then i remember seeing uh the trailer uh and you could see the you know the motel covered in in tinfoil so i was like all right i'm gonna be a creature or something here and then we yeah i stole from bug from mass state lottery without ever having seen bug i saw a still of them in a foil room and i was like damn that looks fucking cool how about i just (laughs) deck out my entire apartment in tinfoil and i did that i just fit it into the movie so that now you guys know that that was not a scripted Seeing yeah. whatever you see in tinfoil. Nice. Well, I gotta welcome, say, welcome back. Hold on, Oki, your your video's off here. I killed your video to protect your privacy. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I was gonna, I was about to say, wait, is it back on yet? No, you're not back no. yet. It just says Oki. Well, can you we can turn it back on? Or? I'm I, all right. Let me see if I can figure this out here. I think you have to turn it back on. It'll be where stop video and start video is. Oh, I see. Okay, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. What? So it's permanent? Yeah, you, yeah, you fucking, <laughs> oh, no. uh, dude, you cock-blocked me here. All right, let me see if I can figure this out here. You know what? Um, here, what if I bump you from the room real quick, and then you just hop back in? Bro, I just, you know, we can just finish it. Like, all, all right, all right, fine. Like, it's just like, I don't need to be shown. Listen, okay. I'm well, going to tell you guys, I I think that what you guys are doing with Mass State Lottery, I was so excited when I saw that trailer. I could tell you, like, it's like, it looks exceptional. Thank you. Like the fucking acting, like even Hans just like saying like, oh, you waited for me. Like that character, <laughs> I want to see that. The classic that char- line. Oh, you I waited I want to see what me. that character is. I think that, that was, like- that scene was one of the most nerve wracking scenes that I had to shoot because we were inside of a mall and I have stage fright and it was all about ignoring everyone and just walking, but for whatever reason, I, I, I struggled a bunch with <laughs> with that scene as we were shooting it. It came out it came out great, like for at least for that sound bite for that trailer. Like the whole trailer just looks fucking awesome. Like I'm really excited to like actually see this movie, and like I I wish you guys the best like with what your guys with what you guys are doing. Because thank think you. It's, I I hope I hope it's gonna be like I can't wait to see it, dude. I really well, can't wait to see it's, it. It's it's look I, maybe I'll tell you this. Once we uh, close out the show, I'll just tell you during the show, fuck it. Uh, I've had two people already, two companies already reach out to me this in one week, just seemingly abruptly in the same span of time, uh, inquiring about Mass State Lottery. So um, I don't even know if we're going to do festivals at this rate. We might just go straight to something, something we'll see. And actually one of the, one of the companies that did reach out to me wanting to put their hands on it, put out a big movie kind of recently. And that's all I'll say. I'll tell you off off mic which one and what movie. But it's cool. It's very cool stuff. And uh, there's also another thing. I haven't even told you about this, Hans, but we might have something lined up for what will be the next movie. I might have somebody in the mix for that. And uh, yeah, it's it's great to hear that uh, you know you took to the trailer, Oki. That's uh, that's oh, awesome. Oh, dude, to I took to the trailer so much. Like you know, I I just did an interview like fucking Mario Co- Como. Like I literally like I I love the music I love the whole fucking look of the thing, like there's not there's so many movies that look like bland, like bland digital fare and it just doesn't have any character it to mm-hmm. character to it, and like you actually you nailed like this character like like this um this feel this vibe that like I really fuck with and I just saw that trailer I'm just I've seen that trailer probably like a hundred times I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> that's awesome that's that's great i mean we shot so much it's been three years in the making almost with this movie and we actually shot way more than i was anticipating so there might not just be like one thing it's not gonna be two movies it's not gonna be two movies but we might have like something maybe it'll be like a deleted scenes reel or maybe we'll turn it into something narrative that'll go supplement to to the movie itself so there's gonna be like when it drops there's gonna be a lot of stuff with that so I'm excited. Yeah, six to get hour director cut. 
No. <laughs> maybe, uh, well, maybe close. I don't know. The, I, I'll share the work print time at some point, but uh, it, it's pretty long. It's pretty Michael Cimino length. Um, all right. That, that Listen, we got to cl cl close out the show on that note. Bug, terrific movie, terrific choice. One of William Friedkin's uh, better films, certainly. You know, I did want to get to the point on William Friedkin, too. He does something that few other directors do, but it is becoming more common. I think Paul Schrader did this as well, where you start strong. You have like a strong 15, 20 years of directing. Then you kind of slump and you hit a lull, and then you come back up late in your life and you do a couple of great films. Paul Schrader, I think, is one of these guys. Uh, Spike Lee, I think, is one of these guys as well, yeah. although it's kind of limited to black Klansman. I don't know about The Five Blood. Uh, yeah, that, that movie was not really my cup of tea. Um, but I think it was better than a lot of the movies he, he had put out prior to Black Klansman. Um, yeah, he, he had a really hard slump. But oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, did, I, did, I have liked some of his recent output. Mm -hmm. Old boy. Yeah, old boy. Other, other than old, old boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I, I do think that's impressive. And I th it makes me wonder if Tracy Letts is really to thank for that the juxtaposition between Friedkin's directing and Lentz's screenwriting is really uh something interesting and you're right in that he kind of nails that sort of dirty gross southern feel uh in this movie and in Killer Joe it's a great double feature uh so anyway that has been movies Oki where can where do you want to direct people I want to direct them to the Oki's Weird uh, Stories channel on YouTube Best documentaries on YouTube. Um, there's no one better. Uh, greatest <laughs> of all time. The GOAT. Go check it out. All right. All right. We'll, we'll include a link in the description so everybody check out Oki's documentaries. Oki, thank you so much for coming back on the show today. I, it's a pleasure. I love this show. It's probably my favorite podcast to do. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, that has been Movies for this week. Thank you for listening.